Hello, and welcome to a new video. Today, covering Nilo Bloom and pretty much everything you need to know to build and most importantly understand her best teams as well as more niche possibilities. Nilo is a character like no one else in the game. AoE Queen, Speedrunner's Proud, and Low Investment Account Salvation. She excels both in the hands of casual free to play and in those of skilled invested players, but especially for free to play and new accounts, she's an absolute beast and many overestimate the amount of tools she needs to carry your account. Just look at how devastating she can be even with free to play characters and a level 1 dual blade. She really is that good. But how is it possible? Her amazing performance at ridiculously low investment is because the devs balanced her around a strikingly high floor, given both by her reliance on a transformative reaction, Bloom, and by a disgustingly broken reaction damage bonus passive which scales with her HP and affects the whole party. This is part of what makes her team so special. Any character, no matter how underwhelming their multipliers or kit in general are, can significantly contribute to the team damage according solely to their ability to apply Dendro or Hydro, or sometimes even more. So, a character like Conley, who doesn't really shine anywhere else and is generally considered a super version of Dendro Traveler, is with Nilo the top Dendro Flex in the best Bloom team, as well as a pivotal gear in similar variants. And Candice, or Kendaka, I, I don't know, an obscure Hydro character barely seen around, with Nilo uncovers an amazing potential in one of the funniest teams I've ever played in this game. Nilo Bloom teams are strong, and apparently simple, only Dendro and Hydro for just one reaction. But despite the harsh Bloom restrictions, they are also surprisingly varied, and its teammates can be built in very different ways. So it's quite normal that players are a bit disoriented when exploring them for the first time, and even experienced players might be confused, since the teams are so different from everything else in the game. With this video, I want to help you understanding the fundamentals of Bloom teams and navigating the realm of possibilities around them, so that you can choose and even craft by yourself the ones that better fit your style and better answer your expectations, in terms of enjoyment, damage output, or both. Assuming you already understand the basics of Nilo's kit, let's start right now. To understand and optimize Bloom teams, we need to understand the Bloom reaction. As you might know, Bloom is a transformative reaction obtained combining Dendro and Hydro, and similarly to Melt and Vaporize, it has a strong side, Dendro, and a weak side, Hydro. If you aren't familiar with these concepts and others like Aura and Trigger, I highly recommend to check out our guide on elemental reactions. I suggest this series by Isa Jeff, which is really well done, but if you are in a hurry, this is a brief recap on the fundamentals needed for this video. Transformative reactions don't care about motion values, damage bonus, crit, they even ignore enemy defense. The only character stats they look at are level and elemental mastery, while the only other two variables in the formula are reaction bonuses, which is also what Nilo's passive provides and they add up with the bonus from elemental mastery, and the enemy dendro resistance, which is why one of your characters should absolutely use the deep set to shred it, increasing damage by usually more than 20%. Too many players ignore how freaking massive the damage gain from raising your characters all the way to level 90 is. Just to make you understand, from level 70 to 80, the reaction gains 40.7% more damage, and from 80 to 90, it's 34.3%. It's a huge gap, and it only costs a few days of resin. Okay, I should have convinced you that character level is a big deal, but what about elemental mastery? Before that, just to be sure we all have a rough idea of what numbers you can expect from the Bloom reaction, I prepared for you this chart. Notice how, without Nilo, Bloom damage is exactly two thirds of Hyper Bloom. That's because the base reaction multipliers for Bloom and Hyper Bloom are respectively 2 and 3, so Hyper Bloom at a baseline would deal exactly 50% more damage than Bloom, but thanks to Nilo, Bloom damage catches up. Now, about Elemental Mastery, even though you can clearly see how good it is, I think most players overrate it. Nani? Don't get me wrong, EM is very important, but many focus too much on it, often making their experience worse and sometimes even losing damage. I'll explain better in the teams and build section, but for now, what you should know is that EM has diminishing returns and Bloom teams already provide quite a bunch of it through several buffs. The more, the merrier of course, but when you start getting a lot of it, the damage increase from getting even more starts being less impactful and that makes EM less competitive, sometimes leaving a legitimate space for stats that give you more comfort or other sources of damage altogether. Still, EM is extremely good and usually you want a lot of it on your Bloom triggers. So, do you need everyone in your Bloom team to be level 90 and do you need everyone to build at least some EM? The answer to both questions is no. Not just because other stats are occasionally competitive or convenient compared to EM, but the reason is that, despite the chaos that reigns in these teams, in a lot of them you still have a decent amount of control and you know that some characters will almost never trigger blooms, if not just a few. 
I already mentioned earlier that Bloom reaction has a strong and a weak side. I won't delve into the depth of gauge theory, but to keep things simple, when you apply Dendro on Hydro, Dendro will basically always remove the latter and generate one Bloom. But when it's Hydro on Dendro, you generally don't consume all the Dendro. A small amount still remains, and you can apply Hydro again to react with it and generate a second Bloom. This, combined with the fact that Dendro characters tend to have less elemental application than some really good Hydro ones, makes so that Reverse Bloom, Hydro on Dendro, is much more efficient and convenient than Forward Bloom, Dendro on Hydro. In a nutshell, you want a Dendro aura on your enemies, because this gives you more Blooms. This can be more or less easy to achieve depending on team, number of enemies, enemy behavior, and also importantly, player skill. But generally speaking, if your enemies have a a hydro aura most of the time, something is wrong either with your team or your playstyle or both. If enemies have mainly a dendro aura, this means that the main bloom trigger will be hydro, and so your bloom's damage will depend on the M and the character level of your hydro characters. Now, since Nilo wants to focus on HP, and people are very familiar with the concept of Hyperbloom teams having only one reliable electro trigger, new Nilo players quite often think it would be better to force a single character to be the main trigger, generally a single Dendro character enabled by strong Hydro applicators. Let's say that's not a great idea. I won't say it won't work, because let's be honest, you can clear Abyss with that and much worse, but it's a very inefficient strategy. At that point, rather play Mono Hydro, you'd get better results. As I mentioned, that approach is common in new Bloom players coming from Hyper Bloom or Hyper Carry teams, because from their experience it's better to put everything in one basket, and maximizing the damage output coming from one character. So let me tell you a crucial concept. In Bloom, quantity is more important than quality. I want to conclude this section talking about Ringless Nilo, where basically you cast this Ward Dance stance to then swap out so that you get Bountiful Course, but you don't have the Hydro Paddle around you. People sometimes come up with this strategy thinking it's better to sacrifice Hydro application in order to maximize Bloom ownership on a full EM Hydro trigger. But as I explained earlier, quantity beats quality, and sacrificing Hydro application generally leads to less Blooms. Generally. Indeed, it's common in single target with a strong Hydro applicator that Hydro overwhelms Dendro, especially without Naida, and when that happens, your Bloom production tanks. So if that's what happens and we have a Hydro aura all the time, wouldn't it be better to completely ditch Nilo's Hydro application? If that's the only way to get at least occasionally a Dendro aura, then technically yes, but at that point I would rather blame the team, the playstyle or both, since fixing them would give you better results. In general, even when doing my best with units like Barbar, DMC and Collie in single target, I've noticed that sacrificing Nilo's ring was never better and at best it gives you about the same clear speed. Which is also why Nilo C1 is not as good as it seems on paper. It's about a 10% in damage increase in favorable conditions, but in practice it's easily less, even going down to zero. Something I usually hear is Nilo needs Nahida. That claim is absolute bulldozer. Let me clarify while I leave in the background more footage of Nilo destroying Abyss without Naida. The Dendro Archon is by far the best Dendro teammate for Bloom teams, who provides both higher ceiling, more flexibility, and incredible comfort. It's not a lie by any means that she's an upgrade any Nilo ever should get as soon as possible, with maybe one little exception. But many exceedingly overestimate how necessary she is. I'll be more specific in the team archetype section, but in a nutshell, Naida makes Bloom teams easier and more reliable in scenarios where Bloom already shines, but it also makes them much stronger and flexible the more suboptimal this scenario is. So when you have multiple enemies hugging you, she often doesn't do much more than solving skill issue, let's say. But in fights with enemies scattered all around, abyss mages, or a single target like a boss, then she really, really makes a huge difference, both in difficulty and damage output. Another cliche is that Nilo needs key because all the other swords suck. Relatively speaking, that's not too wrong, science key is very powerful, and the only other HP sword is Dog Hand, which isn't even much better than Iron Sting. But the reality is that Nilo is so good at a baseline already that you can just give her dual blade and still wipe the abyss floors with enemies' ass. K in Bloom favorable scenarios is kinda overkill often, since enemies there die so fast already. But as soon as this scenario isn't good for Bloom anymore, and especially against bosses, then key really becomes a very big deal. And not just because it makes Blooms much more powerful, but also because it makes easier for some Bloom triggers, who are also strong damage dealers, to build for talent damage rather than EM. So to recap, key is a premium upgrade far from necessary, but that becomes more appealing if you want to more easily brute force challenges where Bloom by design underperforms, with the worst one probably being the Winnat. 
But even that worm isn't scary anymore if you have Naida. Between Naida and Key, definitely prioritize Naida. Also, the weapon banner sucks, just stay away from it. By the way, if you don't have Key or Dog Hand and you don't want to craft Iron Sting and you don't have the Umbrella either, you can use the Dark Iron Sword. The EM difference is negligible and it's a cheap 3 star weapon easily obtainable by talking with this guy in Liue or after 4.4 in this key which you unlock with a quest which starts outside. As you might already know, in Bloom Nilo wants as much HP as possible up to maxing her E4 passive at 74,444 HP and after that she only really cares about EM and maybe some energy recharge. ER is useful but not mandatory. Nilo's burst is a handy skill for immediately applying a lot of hydro in a large area when multiple enemies are scattered around and and you have downtime on your other AoE Hydro skills. Having it always available isn't necessary, but having it more often gives your team more cards to play, which is good because one of Nilo's biggest strengths is her combat flexibility. Since Nilo can trigger a lot of seeds, many wonder how important it is to prioritize HP over EM when she doesn't reach the A4 passive cap. If you're interested, I've done some research on it a long time ago, link to the post in the description. But in a nutshell, unless Nilo owns more than half of your team blooms, you always prioritize HP% percent over EM, no matter what. So HP% percent main stats and HP% percent 2P sets are a no-brainer since Nilo never triggers that many blooms. About the flop set, which many casuals erroneously consider Nilo's best in slot, it's only better than a 2-piece HP combination when you already reached the 74,000 HP cap, which even for key owners is extremely hard without artifact effects. Effects. Or it also becomes better when Nilo's bloom ownership reaches about 46%. As I said earlier, Nilo normally doesn't own so many blooms. She's usually closer to 25 up to 35, maybe 40%. But if you play Nilo field, and even better with a sacrificial sword to enable both her hydro stances, then she's very likely to break the threshold and go much higher. So even though I'd like to do more research on it in the future, I think flop before wailing can be her best in slot for an on-field bloom playstyle. Of course, using Nilo field like that is suboptimal, but can still be really fun and her emissions are gorgeous. For the other substats, Grit is essentially trash, while Flat HP is actually pretty good. I know some guides, even reliable, recommend Flat HP over EM, but to me they are very similar and if anything EM seems to be a bit better. Exact ratios really depend on a ton of variables and maybe other guide makers use different assumptions, but in general consider them roughly equally good. I remind you that a Flat HP substat is valuable about a third of an HP percent one. For building Naida, I don't have much to say about artifact sets and weapons, just use Deep Wood, because one has to use it and she's the best by far at using it. You really want 100% percent uptime on that rash red. So even if you could consistently apply the effect using a second dendro, you would need to start the rotation with that dendro instead of Naida, and Naida is the best dendro to start your rotation. Also, Naida's talent damage in these teams isn't really a lot, so going out of your way to increase it by, I don't know, 20% maybe with a golden troop set is not worth the hassle. Weapon options are many, and just to mention a few common ones, she can use our Sacrificial with Seed, Fab for more team energy, and Proto Ember if you want more survivability at the cost of losing a lot of Naida's talent damage, which can be a reasonable trade because, as already mentioned, her skill damage isn't really that relevant in Bloom anyway. But what I really want to talk about is her stats, and I'll go straight to the point. In double dendro teams, which are the most popular and where enemies have almost always a dendro aura, you simply want to build Naida like you would do in most scenarios. Which means that EM is about as good as damage bonus in crit until your effective EM stays below 1000. People are too rigid on mid-up rules like use an EM goblet or with an EM weapon use a crit circlet, but this is nonsense. Naida's kit is so marvelously designed that it basically balances itself, so as a general rule, go with better substats, and with equally good pieces maybe give elemental mastery a preference since Naida can still trigger a couple of blooms, and if she's played off field, EM actually gets a tiny 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 bit more value. Here you can see calcs with different main stats. The biggest and only somewhat relevant gap is when Naida is off field with a crit weapon and only one EM main stat, and it's like 5%. And other than that, there's pretty much no difference at all, no matter the combination of weapon and main stat. I want to stress out that this Naida here, when removing the buffs, has only 500 EM, and she's only 5% worse than one with triple EM. That's not a lot, especially for a minor damage contributor in your team. I've talked about Double Dendro, but things become different when Naida starts triggering more blooms in teams with extremely high Hydro application. I'm talking about Triple Hydro teams, and this is the first bloom archetype we're going to cover in this series.